Let's move along from consciousness now and talk a little bit about sleep. You can see on this slide that there is a graph and then a series of squiggles. This graph is the graph of the sleep cycle. It's going to be staying on the bottom of all of these slides so you can sort of keep track of it the entire time while I'm teaching you about the different stages of sleep. You may want to redraw one in your notes and sort of label the sections while I'm speaking because understanding using this graph as a visual aid is a really important way to understand how sleep works. So the first thing I want you to notice is that the graph kind of goes up and down, right? That stages one through four are listed along the side, along the y-axis, and time, like how long you've been asleep, is along the x-axis or along the bottom. Um, notice we don't just go stages one, two, three, four, five, wake up, right? That the graph goes up and down through the stages multiple times per night. This is the key to how the sleep cycle works. It is a cycle that lasts about 90 minutes or an hour and a half for the average person. Then you go through each stage of sleep multiple times per night until you wake up. So the first stage of sleep um, is a very light sort of borderline drowsing kind of sleep, like when you're nodding off in class or falling asleep in the car and you're still maybe peripherally aware of what's going on around you, but you don't care and you're just sort of dozing off. That borderline stage, uh, that's stage one. And something that can occur in this stage is something called a hypnagogic hallucination. You can look that spelling up in your textbook um, or on your phone or something, but hypnagogic means during sleep and hallucination is a hallucination. So what this means is that you are having a like really vivid perceptions or sensations while you're falling asleep. Um, like if you ever have the sense of falling off of something or running into something, or sometimes people will see really vivid like colors or images right after they fall asleep or right while they're falling asleep, these are called hypnagogic hallucinations. And they're caused by the transition in your brain from alpha waves, which are the brain waves that you experience while you're awake, to theta waves, which you experience while you sleep. So theta waves, and when I say brain waves, I mean the pattern of electrical activity that you can see on an electroencephalogram in the EEG machine. So you can see the little, sort of squiggly lines next to the sleep cycle graph on your picture on the slide. Those are pictures of different brain waves or EEG readings at different stages of sleep. So in stage one, you have theta waves, which are a very low frequency and very low amplitude brain wave. So low amplitude means they're short, and low frequency means they're slow. So this is your brain sort of slowing down, having less frequent activity uh, to reflect the fact that you're falling asleep. The next stage, appropriately named stage two, uh, we spend a decent amount of time in stage two, especially towards the latter end of the night, towards the sort of latter half of while you're, you've been asleep for a while. Um, but basically you have these theta waves and then you have these bursts of strong activity called a sleep spindle. Um, basically, they're called that because they look like spindles. You can see them on the chart that's below the, the text here on the slide. But the theta waves come in like this, and then you have this big spike, and then they keep going. That big spike is called a sleep spindle. Um, there's some thinking that it corresponds to your nervous system kind of testing itself in a way. Uh, but essentially you'll have your muscles twitching and moving around and these sleep spindles occur in your brain at the same time. So that's what's going on in stage two. Stage three, uh, this stage is when you start to have the emergence of something called delta waves. Now stages three and four are pretty similar. The only difference is that in stage three you only have delta waves some of the time and in stage four you have them all of the time. So some texts will kind of merge them together and just call them delta wave sleep. But a delta wave is a very low frequency, high amplitude wave. So it's slow, but there's a lot of energy. And delta wave sleep is sometimes referred to as your deepest, sort of most restful, highest quality sleep, because this is when you're really getting the value of sleep that you need. Um, delta waves occur in your brain when your memories are sort of knitting themselves together, your synapses are becoming more solidified. Anything that you encoded during the day becomes more connected, more associations are formed between new information you've learned and old information that was already there. Those associations are strengthened during delta wave sleep. Um, so this type of sleep is really important. If you look at the sleep cycle graph, you'll notice we enter stages three and four early in our night right, during the first half of our sleep. And that's on purpose because your body is trying to get the most important sleep done early so that you can still have restful sleep. Um, 
These delta waves start to emerge in stage three, where you're sort of deepening, but you're not fully there yet. What also starts to emerge in stage three are sleep disorders, things like sleepwalking and night terrors. And we're going to talk more about sleep disorders on a different day, but this is when they start to emerge. Uh, stage four, like I said, not that different from stage three. The only difference is that in stage four, you have all delta waves, and in stage three, they're just emerging. So this is your deepest sleep, stage four. It's the most restful. You'll notice we only go through about an hour to two hours of delta wave, really strong stage four delta wave sleep every night, and the rest of the time is lighter. Um, so this is the sort of key time for your brain to really do its work, to rest itself. Um, if you wake yourself up about after about two hours in a nap, you will feel like absolute garbage, right? If you notice you wake up after two hours or four before you really fully finish that sleep cycle out, you feel terrible and more tired than you did when you went to sleep. That's because you're waking yourself up in the middle of stage four. It can also be really difficult to wake someone up who's in stage four because of how deep down their brain is, how big of a transitional gap there is between alpha waves and delta waves. The final stage of sleep is called REM stage. REM stands for rapid eye movement. And the reason it's called that is that this is the stage when you dream. Your brain is pretty similar to how your brain acts while it's awake. You do see some reemergence of alpha waves a little bit in uh, REM sleep. And because your mind thinks you're awake while you're dreaming, you can actually see your eyes moving around behind your eyelids, hence the name. So during REM sleep, your muscles are relaxed and paralyzed. And what that means is that your body is held fairly still on purpose because, again, your brain can't tell the difference between dreams and wakefulness. So if your muscles weren't paralyzed, you'd be running around acting out your dreams. Uh, and that's not always a great thing, right? Some people have some pretty crazy dreams. So your muscles, voluntary muscles anyway, not things like your lungs, are paralyzed. Um, your respiration and your heart rate are allowed to sort of move up and down as they need to. So you will have people... Um, experience something called sleep paralysis, which is when you wake up during REM stage sleep and your muscles are still paralyzed from being in REM. So you're conscious and your heart can beat faster, but you can't move. Um, this is a pretty terrifying experience, but it's harmless. It's, I mean, it goes away after a minute or two and then you're fine. Uh, but it's a consequence of this sort of voluntary muscle paralysis that occurs during REM sleep. And some of the muscles that are not paralyzed are your eye muscles. So you can see them moving around behind your eyelids, which is why it's called rapid eye movement. Um, you'll notice you have four or five dreams every night. REM stage is sort of that little uh, darker colored bar at the top of the sleep cycle. It's at the top because it's got uh, high levels of brain activity that are similar to when you're awake. So we put that at the top to reflect that. Um, and also, you're dreaming multiple times per night. The trick with dreams is that they only really exist in short-term memory. So while you're having the dream, you can recall it, but as soon as you wake up, it fades away, it fizzles, because you're not encoding that permanently into your long-term memory. Um, which basically, if you want to remember your dreams more often, you have to lay there and rethink over them again to get them to become more permanent. But you are dreaming a lot. A lot of people just don't remember them, or if they do remember them, they don't remember them very often. On the next slide, I have a bigger version of the sleep cycle graph in case you wanted to draw it, take a picture of it, or just have a bigger one for reference. Um, so you can use that there. Today's lesson is about sleep disorders. This is a pretty popular topic, so I'm pretty excited to uh, be able to teach you guys about it, even though I'm not there to do it. Uh, but sleep disorders are basically problems. They can be neurological, they can be cognitive, they can be physical, but it's any kind of problem that disrupts your sleep. The reason we talk about these now instead of when we talk about everything else related to mental health is that they're specifically rated, related to sleep, so I figured it made more sense to do them here. The first sleep disorder that we're going to discuss is narcolepsy. Um, narcolepsy is a neurological disorder. This isn't something you can catch or like develop. It's something that you're going to be born with that sort of emerges um, sometimes in childhood, sometimes in adolescence, sometimes in adulthood, but it's not, it's not contagious. You can't cause narcolepsy. It's something that you just have. Um, essentially, this is an issue with the neurons in your brain where you're sleepy and tired all the time. So you're constantly falling asleep sort of without control during the day. You're having this excessive fatigue, whatever. And the reason for it all boils down to the fact that people with narcolepsy spend almost no time in delta wave sleep. When they go to sleep, they enter REM almost right away. 
and spend way longer in REM and stages one and two than in any of the other stages of sleep. So they're not really getting that actual restful stage three and four delta wave sleep that they need. So their brain isn't actually resting the way it needs to, which makes them tired and sleepy all the time. So a narcoleptic can fall asleep in the middle of driving a car or in the middle of class without any ability to control that behavior because of this sort of change in where their brain is handling or processing sleep. Um, narcoleptics also experience more hypnagogic hallucinations than the average population, and they experience something called cataplexy, which is essentially after any burst of strong emotion or feeling, excitement, joy, rage, whatever it may be, they can have this extreme muscle weakness, like all their muscles just turn to jelly. If you've had a really st like strenuous workout or you went on a long run, and then you feel really weak and tired afterwards, that's what cataplexy feels like, only the strain is not coming from exercise, but from just excessive cognitive load, like strong emotions. Um, so there really is no cure for narcolepsy. The treatments are to use different kinds of stimulants or medicines that affect the nervous system in your brain. Um, sometimes antidepressants can help, and sometimes they'll be given medicines to increase the amount of delta wave sleep that they experience. But these are all just treatments or symptom management. There's really no way to get rid of it. The next sleep disorder we're going to cover is sleep apnea. This one is much more common. This is the most common. This and insomnia are the most common of the sleep disorders. Um, sleep apnea is when you're having really, really loud snoring, but it's not just a snoring disorder or whatever. It's caused by pauses in breathing. So you can see I have an image right here. What happens with sleep apnea is that while you are sleeping, your throat collapses. Okay, so uh, collapse, it sounds, I make it sound really dangerous when I do that, but your, your airway will get blocked by the back of your tongue, by the tissues in your mouth, whatever it may be. This is why sleep apnea is linked with obesity. It's because there's more pressure on the neck due to excess weight. But you don't have to be obese to have sleep apnea. There are marathon runners that catch it. Um, so it's just kind of a random thing that appears in some people. But your airway collapses while you're sleeping, and then you're not breathing, right? There's no air getting in because your throat is collapsed. So you take a big snore, which is why it's associated with loud snoring. You take a big snore in to force the airway open so that you can breathe. And so this pause in breathing that occurs from your airway collapsing is called an apnea. And the fact that they occur while sleeping is why it's called sleep apnea. So the symptoms are loud snoring, obviously, but also fatigue and tiredness during the day because every time you have a pause in breathing, it wakes you up and interrupts your sleep. So you may not fully regain consciousness, but it's interrupting that sleep cycle and you're not getting restful sleep. So people with sleep apnea often will have no idea that they have it. Uh, and they'll just be tired during the day and it feels like they're sort of just randomly tired for no reason. Now, the treatment for sleep apnea can be as simple as just sleeping on your side. Because if you're sleeping on your side instead of on your back, your throat doesn't have any, or as many, opportunities to collapse. So you're not having the same amount of apneas that you would if you were sleeping on your back. Um, there's also this machine. You can see it in the picture here on the slide. There's a machine called a CPAP device which is basically a mask that you would wear that's connected to an air tank with compressed air in it that increases the amount of air pressure inside your mouth, nose, and throat to keep that airway open. Because if there's more pressure in there from air, then it's not going to be able to, the tissues in there aren't going to be able to collapse the same way. So you end up avoiding these pauses in breathing by having the CPAP machines. They used to be really loud and obnoxious, there's been a lot of development in this technology to make them quieter and more comfortable, but you still do have to wear a mask all the time. The next sleep disorder we're going to cover is called sleep walking. Um, this one I'm sure you guys have heard of, but basically uh, it's getting up while you're sleeping. So you're still not conscious, but you're getting up anyway and doing basically anything you could do while you're awake. Walking around, doing dishes, playing with Hot Wheels, turn on the TV, uh, whatever, right? but you're doing it totally without any consciousness. So nobody is piloting the ship, so to speak. Um, so it can be simple things like walking around or it can be complex things like driving a car. My very first year teaching, a student shared a story with me. She was a chronic sleepwalker uh, that her mom told her she woke up at three in the morning, walked down her stairs in her house, got in her car and drove around the block while sleeping 
and then parked the car, got out, and went back to bed. Uh, after that, they started locking up her car keys at night so that she wouldn't do that anymore. Um, thankfully, she was fine, but still scary, right? There are actually uh, two cases that I know of, and there may be more, of people who were like violent, beat up their family members while sleepwalking uh, without having any conscious awareness of it. So it can be kind of dangerous. It's much more common in children than in adults, and uh, kids typically, if they get it as kids, will grow out of it. So there's some thinking that it may be linked to um, underdevelopment in your brain or in the nervous system. And that as your central nervous system starts to develop uh, or become fully mature, the sleepwalking will go away. Uh, in some people, though, it is chronic, and sometimes it can be related to just nothing, or it can be related to some kind of psychological or mental health issue that's going on. So the treatment can be something as simple as putting up one of those, like, child gates on stairwells to prevent kids from falling down the stairs, or locking up doors and windows at night to prevent people from trying to open windows and go out on the roof, or doing things like owning a gun safe, right? Um, <laughs> but... If it's chronic and people, and then this is especially true for people who have it as adults, um, there are medications that can help reduce the impact of sleepwalking, and sometimes antidepressants can be helpful too. Really feeling like someone was in their room or something scary was happening, but it's not going to be very specific. Uh, it's not going to be detailed like a nightmare. Um, typically, night terrors are caused by stress or lack of proper sleep. So people, if, if a person is really stressed out during the day, isn't eating well, isn't sleeping enough, things like that, a night terror can be a result of that stress. Um, so sometimes the treatment is as simple as reducing stress in your life, eating well, and getting plenty of rest, and the night terror will go away. Some people have them more chronically, and usually that is a result of some kind of other mental or physical issue that's going on with a person that's resulting in these night terrors occurring more frequently. And for those people, there are medications that can help. Um, but again, usually it's a stress response. The last one we're going to cover is insomnia. Insomnia comes from Latin, somnus meaning sleep, and in meaning lack of, right? Uh, like immortal has that same in root at the beginning, which means not mortal. It's a, neg it's a negative, right? So insomnia means unable to sleep, and that's literally what the disorder is. When you have trouble falling asleep or staying asleep, and that happens over a long period of time, that's referred to as insomnia. Um, Sometimes it can be you just have a tough time falling asleep, but once you fall asleep, you stay there. Sometimes it can be waking up a bunch of times during the night and sleep not being restful. Um, irritability, fatigue, problems with concentration during the day can result. But those are all symptoms of not sleeping enough, right? So the real issue here is that the person just can't sleep. Um, sometimes it's treated with sleeping pills, although this is usually considered a short-term solution because sleeping pills can be habit-forming. And they can, uh, you can develop a tolerance to them in your brain. And so you'll need more and more dosage for them to do the same thing. So you can also treat insomnia through relaxation exercises, like a therapist or a doctor will teach the person how to relax their mind and body so that they can sort of switch off and get to sleep. Um, developing a good habit or routine of sleep, things like not exposing yourself to bright lights or screens for two hours before you go to bed. This is called illumination or light therapy. The concept here is that there are the sleep, um, the sleep hormone in your brain that gets your brain to fall asleep. It's called melatonin. It is reduced. The amount of melatonin in your brain is reduced when you're exposed to bright light because your brain thinks it's daytime. So if you have dim lights and you don't have a lot of bright screens in your face, while you're a few hours away from going to bed, you can increase the amount of melatonin in your brain, make it easier to fall asleep. Um, also, having a routine of sort of going to bed and getting up at the same time every night, um, not using the bed for anything other than sleeping, so like doing homework, reading, playing video games. If you do a lot of other things in bed, your brain is not really associating the bed with sleeping, so it can be more difficult to fall asleep there. Um, also, things like not eating a whole bunch of caffeine and chocolate right before bed. Stimulants wake up your brain, make it hard to sleep. So you can develop sort of good sleep habits and a good routine and sort of conquer insomnia that way. Um, but there are some other treatments that can be pursued for people who suffer from it chronically.